like to introduce my colleague, Professor Richard Bithar. Richard is a Melbourne neurosurgeon and his current areas of interest are spinal surgery, neuromodulation for pain and movement disorders, psychosurgery and neuro-oncology. And Richard's going to talk to us on neurosurgical management of pain syndromes with a word about frontiers. Richard, please. Thanks very much, Graham. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Epworth for putting on this symposium. And uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for supporting it. I'd like to focus today, there's a lot you can talk about when it comes to neurosurgical frontiers. And really, when it comes to neurosurgery and where things are changing the quickest, uh, neuromodulation is, is that area. And so I'd like to focus today really on the way that we're using neuromodulation to treat specifically uh, pain. And we use neuromodulation to treat a lot of different conditions, but pain is a big condition that we treat with it. So what is neuromodulation? Well, that's where we use some sort of electrical current in some part of the nervous system, whether that's the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system, to modulate the way that information flows through and to modulate the way that people experience pain or the way that movement disorders are manifested. The most common areas that we would, most common conditions that we would treat are certainly pain. Numerically, pain is the number one uh, condition treated uh, by neuromodulation. Movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease and psychiatric conditions are really starting to uh, become uh, or to generate a greater degree of interest. The numbers are still small, but they are treating them nonetheless. But um, talking about pain, uh, there are a number of conditions that we can now uh, treat uh, using these techniques. Headaches, failed back surgery, which we've, we've heard a little bit about uh, now, and, and unfortunately there is a huge amount of failed back surgery out there. Um, you know, as, as spinal surgeons, we don't like to to admit that, and, and we all have cases that, that haven't worked, and we all have a lot of cases that haven't worked, um, and that can be really difficult to treat, and neuromodulation is certainly offered as an opportunity to offer some hope to patients that have tried other things. And there are a couple of other conditions, such as angina and peripheral vascular disease, which are also painful conditions, uh, for which um, spinal cord stimulation does offer a benefit. So to go back to some of the discussion that uh, was had in one of the earlier talks about lesional techniques, and the question was asked about chordotomy and whether that's still being done, a lot of these lesioning procedures have been done now for the past 80, 90 or 100 years or even more in one form or another. Cutting a nerve was one of the earliest neurosurgical operations to be, to be done, and in some cases it did work. We decompress nerves. We do all of those things. You can do chordotomies where you cut the spinal cord in the, the right spot. Uh, Dres lesions, as, as Graham mentioned before. A lot of those techniques do have considerable, ben ben considerable benefit for a lot of patients, and the success rates can be upwards of 50% and sometimes a lot higher. One of the problems with many of those techniques is that they are irreversible. Once you've done it, you can't take it back if the patient's had an adverse neurological outcome, uh, the chance of recovery is extremely small. Uh, one of the other problems with a lot of these conditions is that you can cause deafferentation pain. And as you know, that can be an extremely difficult condition to treat. I'd like to first talk about peripheral nerve stimulation, predominantly around the head and the neck, but uh, we'll also move on to other parts of the body as well. Occipital nerve stimulation, which is really the main type of peripheral nerve stimulation that we do around the head and neck, uh, has a number of indications. Migraine, occipital neuralgia, these cervicogenic headaches, um, I'll talk about those. Post-traumatic surgical pain, even pain following herpes, um, uh, neuralgia, uh, herpes infection and cluster headaches. The main nerves that we would target on the head and neck would be the occipital nerves as well as the supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves depending on where the pain is. Now we know that chronic daily headache is a very common problem. One in 20 people uh, in the community would have chronic daily headache. Most of these seem to be uh, uh, transformed migraine. There seems to be a big overlap uh, and a lot of difficulty made, um, uh, uh, a lot of difficulty experienced in making a clear diagnosis and, and making a distinction between occipital neuralgia and transformed migraine. Unfortunately, we have neurologists that can help with those sorts of uh, diagnoses. 
but we've really seen uh, occipital nerve stimulation become a lot more widely applied to treat um, uh, a lot of these types of headaches. So occipital neuralgia, it's, a, it's a, a neuralgic type of pain that occurs generally at the back of the head in the distribution of the greater and lesser occipital nerves, sometimes the third occipital nerves. They'll often be very tender over those nerves. They'll often uh, have their pain reproduced and exacerbated by it. And many of them will improve with a, a nerve block. Cervicogenic headaches, these are increasingly recognised. I think that uh, certainly out there, out there in general practice 10 or 15 years ago, uh, cervicogenic headaches were not um, as often uh, recognised as they are now. Uh, we see them a lot uh, in patients that come to us with cervical spine problems and essentially any pathology in the neck can result in cervicogenic headaches. They're often associated with neck pain um, and they can follow a variety uh, of, of pathologies uh, including whiplash injuries, surgery, disc prolapses, facet joint arthropathy, uh, you name it. They often get this throbbing uh, behind their eyes and, and a bifrontal component as well. So what are the criteria for inserting an occipital nerve uh, stimulator? Well, the pain certainly has to be refractory to the usual medical management um, options. Uh, generally, you'd want them to have preserved sensation, and that's a, that's a, that's a rule that we apply to, most type, to all types of peripheral nerve stimulation. You have to have something to stimulate. Now, I have had patients that have had occipital neuralgia that have actually had their occipital nerves successfully cut and who have had deafferentation pain and in that situation have just gone lower down in the neck and found uh, where the occipital nerves still seem to be uh, working to a degree and stimulated there with a, with a good result. And of course you need to have a very thorough psychological and psychiatric workup because the biggest disaster obviously is operating on someone uh, who uh, has a lot more than just a, just a physical issue. Uh, and the good thing about most of these types of treatments, most neuromodulation, is you do a trial. So it's not like doing a lumbar fusion or a microdiscectomy or some other procedure. You do a trial of stimulation which is much less invasive than the permanent uh, implantation and you see whether that helps and if it doesn't you take things out and if it does you can go on to do a permanent uh, implantation. So with occipital nerve stimulation, these trials are generally conducted over three to seven days. We often bring the patients into hospital, but we'll often send them home after a day or two and we encourage them to go about their usual activities. Uh, it's done with the patients awake, we infiltrate with some local anaesthetic, you make a few small incisions, and you place these electrodes across the greater and lesser occipital nerves, and you do some testing on the operating table to make sure that you're in the right area and then you stitch the electrodes in and they go, go away and they test them for a week or so. And we do detailed uh, recordings of their medication use, their daily function, and also their um, pain levels. Generally speaking, uh, these uh, trials are successful in at least 70 or 80% of patients. And irrespective of whether they're successful or not, we take them out at the end of the trial and uh, then we make a decision about what to do next. So how do we define success? Uh, generally speaking, we define it as a greater than 50% pain relief, a substantial reduction in their medication intake, an improvement in their quality of life and functioning. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, patient satisfaction uh, is the main thing. 